there's sort of a, I think there's two basic ways that teachers of religious texts teach. Um, if you're teaching a book, if you're teaching a text, then you naturally are bound by that text because what you're teaching is what's in the book. And so the book delimits the scope of what you're going to teach naturally. Did you guys follow that? Like, for instance, if I'm teaching a capoeira class, which is like a Brazilian sort of primarily legs, funky dance slash martial art, right? So if I'm going to teach a capoeira class, then just by definition, I'm not teaching a class in Japanese. Did you follow that? I'm not going to teach a ja class in Japanese language. Japanese, I could teach it in Japanese language, but I'm not going to be teaching a class on Japanese grammar. Does that make sense? This is kind of an obvious point, but I think it still bears mentioning. So, um, there's nothing wrong with, can we pin me here? Is that okay? Can somebody do that? Sorry, I'm just having to change the view on this. Kim? Oh, Kim's not here? All right. Um, it seems like an obvious point, but I'm fairly certain none of you really understand it. So I'm just going to say it again. And forgive me if it sounds a bit remedial, but I actually think there's value in this. If you're teaching a text, then you are, by definition, limited to what's contained within that text. You can offer context, additional information that literally goes with the text. That's what context means. You can give background information, you can look at history, you can look at the language, but by design, everything anchors back onto the primary thing, which is the words in the book that you're teaching. Did you guys follow that? If I'm looking at grammar, it's what grammar that pertains to the words in the book. If I'm looking at context, it's surrounding elements that pertain or are relevant or are related to the words in the book. Did you follow this? If I want to give illustrations, they're illustrations that shine light on what's in the book. If I want to give analogies, they have to relate back to the text at hand. If I want to talk about history, it's the history of how the book came to be or the culture that arose, that the book took place within, etc., etc. The very nature of teaching a text is that it ties you down to the text just like teaching everything does so. Did you guys follow that? Let's, let's pay attention. You got some problem with your eyes? No. All right, dude, come on. They're not sunglasses, they're just... Fashion glasses? No. <laughs> hey, we'll just zip it and take them off. Unless it's an eye conditioning. There you go. Thank you, man. Um, I appreciate that you want to see me bathed in blue light, but <laughs> we're good, all right? Um, that's not a bad thing. Books aren't bad, but they do create parameters for what you're teaching. Otherwise, if you don't want to be limited by the book and by the text, 
What should you do? You should just give a lecture on whatever you want to talk about. And then you're free. You're free to do whatever you want to do. Did you follow that? But if you're tethered to a text, then that text defines what you're going to teach in a primary and ever-present way. You're tangenting off the text. You get off topic, which means you're off the topic at hand at the text. The, the, the value of your class is the illumination you provide on the information contained within the text. You guys follow this? So, I mean, I really like the books I teach. So I find that through the porthole of the texts that I teach, I find that the world opens up and becomes pretty big. And so although the text may be small, it opens up into a big world. And in that way, the text is magical. It's like the closet in the Chronicles of Narnia that the protagonists pass through into another dimension. And I'm pretty sure there's a gazillion other um, modern-day versions of that from Harry Potter. It's like the, the whole idea, even if you look at entheogenic cultures and use ayahuasca or mescaline or whatever, there's this idea that that drug itself becomes a portal through which you pass into another world. And so, in the same way that meditation oftentimes is seen as a portal that gives you access to a higher dimension of reality, similarly, the sacred text for people who consider them sacred is just such a portal, put down and codified for posterity's sake to make something repeatable, and in that sense, scientific, because it can be done by future generations, and it's left, the math, the arithmetic is left for future generations to follow and get the same results. You guys following it now? So I think these sacred texts are sacred. I think they have incredible value. And so instead of feeling limited by them, I feel that that limitation actually opens up a door to another dimension, to another reality, a much broader, more beautiful, more colorful, more vibrant, more attractive, more meaningful, more profound world. And strangely, the way you get there assuredly is by being very chaste to the text. So by anchoring yourself to the text and being careful and limiting yourself and not getting too creative and being conservative with your exegesis, which is your drawing out of meaning from the text, and using careful hermeneutics, those are rules of interpretation, by doing those things, you actually end up springboarding more powerfully into that world. Did you guys follow that? So it's a unique phenomenon. The text, like everything else, limits you. I'm teaching a jiu-jitsu class. I'm not teaching a class on haiku. They're just, they're two different subjects. I'm not teaching a class on how to make a salad. You can use metaphors from one thing to illustrate the other, but you're always tied to the other in a primary way. You're tied to the thing you're teaching. And everything else is in service to that. Otherwise, you're a spastic teacher who can't stay on point, and you'll only attract spastic students who just want to wander around without ever definitively getting anywhere. Do you guys follow that? So, it's important to know what you're doing. It's just as important to know what you're not doing. There's a guy I really like whose name escapes me at the moment. But he has a motto, a slogan, a mission statement, a very short, terse statement of what his group does. They're a megachurch. 
super popular. Probably 100,000 people a week attend his services. So they have a, they have a, I mean, he's a whole mission around him. He's huge, big guy. Adam, I want to say Adam Sandler, but that's the name of an actor. It's Adam, and his last name starts with an S, and I just, you know, whatever. I'll remember it later. Um, anyway, his motto is, we build churches that unchurched people love to attend. We build churches that unchurched people love to attend. Of course, the word unchurched for me was a, a neologism. It was a new word. I'd never seen the word unchurched before. And so, but I, of course, immediately knew what it meant because it's self-evident, self-explanatory, what the term means. People who are not already going to church. We build churches that unchurched people. If you're not going to church, it's because you think churches are lame or you're not into it, or for whatever reason, they're not attractive enough to you to get you off your butt and put bums in seats, so to speak. So they want to build churches that are attractive for the every man, for the every woman, for everybody. You follow? Hence the title. And they're Christians, so hence the title. We build churches that unchurched people love to attend. Now, he could be doing anything. He could be like, you know, ending world hunger, or digging wells, you know, in India, or fighting hunger, you know, in Africa. There's a million things he could be doing. But he's not doing those things. What's he doing? He's building churches. That's his goal, to put up churches. What type of churches? Churches that are loved by unchurched people. How's that love manifested? They come to your church. We build churches that unchurched people love to attend. And guaranteed, he pivoted with COVID. And they went online in a big way. They were already online in a big way. They probably went mega online. And now, because these guys are, this group is tight. They're on point. They're, they're, they're um, always aware of the zeitgeist. And they're always aware of exactly, you know, what's trending and what's going to be the next big thing. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a very limiting statement. It's a super limiting statement. Um, the Ritz-Carlton has a statement. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. It's much more broad, actually, in its scope. It's not a bad mission statement either. We're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. So it, it communicates that you also get to have some integrity and that you're not just an indentured servant or something like that. And it communicates to the people who are in the service industry some self-respect. Anyway, and, and, that they, and also that the people they're serving have to behave respectably as well. But it's much more broad in terms of what you might do for people. Does that make sense? Target, you know, expect more, pay less. That's so broad. It's a terrible mission statement. It's so broad to be almost cognitively, cognitively meaningless. It's so broad as to be almost cognitively meaningless. Sometimes people want to get this really cool mission statement that just, you know, it's like a, a millennial FOMO, and so you want to be everything. You want to be like a car salesman and a lawyer and an astronaut and the Queen of England all wrapped in one. Your mission statement has some cops and all that. And you end up saying, like, love everyone without limit in all ways for the best of everything. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's my mission statement. And it just becomes cognitively meaningless. You follow? Now, Target, it's the worst mission statement I've ever heard, except for that they're Target. And therefore, well, you know, we're going to build a university? Yeah, we could. Expect more, pay less? Yeah, if we built a university, we'd be trying to build a better university than Walmart, right? And charge a little more money than Walmart does, but not as much as you'd pay if you went anywhere else. You follow? Expect more, pay less. You get it? They're such a big company, a Fortune 50 company, that they can say ridiculous things like expect more, pay less, and have that be a mission statement. ISKCON's unofficial motto is more devotees, happier devotees, which is a phenomenal, a phenomenal mission statement. Four words, just like Target, more devotees. That means we do outreach, happier devotees, that means we're also doing in-reach. 
got everything. I can't see any flaw in it. Super tight. It's like Mayweather's Philly shell, if you know anything about boxing. Anyway, so it's a, like an unbelievably powerful mission statement. My restaurant, we serve great vegan food so well that anyone can happily live cruelty free. 14 words, what are we doing? We're serving great vegan food. If it's not vegan, and it's not food, it's not ahimsa. I might have some other project I do, but as far as ahimsa goes, it's about food. What kind of food? Vegan food. Do those limit me? They sure do. Do I want to be limited in that way? I do, so I can be focused and do what I want to do. There's benefit in being focused. There's benefit in knowing where you want to go. We serve great vegan food. How, how well? So well. So well that what? That anybody can happily live cruelty free. It's a good mission statement. Because now my little mom and pop restaurant is now connected to a bigger vision of making the world cruelty free. And what we're doing on the daily is in service of that mission. You guys following this? It's good to know who you are, what you do. It's also good to know what you don't do. Don't think that limitations are bad. Limitations are where beautiful things come. When you get focused enough on something that you commit to it, which means you're not committed to other things that are going to be antagonistic to the thing you are committed to, you then make rapid progress in the area you want to make progress in. You get married. You're limited. You follow? But that limitation is the birthplace of so many beautiful things. You become a parent of a particular child. You're limited. And that limitation becomes the birthplace of beautiful, powerful things. Don't be afraid of committing. Don't be afraid of making good decisions. Committing and making good decisions is where everything beautiful comes from. You guys following this? So, there's two ways to give class on a sacred text. Number one, you just go through the book and you see what it says, you see what it teaches, and then you teach what it teaches. Now the book is your map. The, evol the evolution of the teachings as contained in the book are your map. You're following the book. The book introduces subjects in a particular way. You introduce those subjects in a particular way. The book has certain main thematic teachings. You have certain main thematic teachings. And you are flowing with the text, and the text defines what you do. That is, let's say, the traditional way of teaching. It's a good way of teaching. It's how we teach. It's why Prabhupada's books, amongst all the Neo-Hindu groups in the world, were not really Neo-Hindu. Why? Because we go through our sacred texts, line by line, and we do traditional commentaries on them that are designed to illuminate the whole text. Nobody does this. Everybody writes novels, Deepak Chopra-esque stuff, where they do a little like, like an homage to some Vedic teaching somewhere, this or that. It's all translated culturally. It's all translated philosophically. It's all translated linguistically. And it's just cobbled together. And really what you're getting is somebody else's philosophy, but wrapped up with a little bit of like Hindu bow ties with a, a slightly Hindu-esque delivery mechanism. And that's Neo-Hindu thought, and that's how everybody writes. They just write their own novels with their own ideas, and then you make some reference to some ancient text to give some authority or some auth 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 authenticity to what they're teaching. You guys following us? We don't do that. We go through verse by verse. Half our book is Sanskrit. We go through line by line, verse by verse, with traditional commentaries. It's the way people have been doing for, for thousands of years. In that sense, we have a very traditional approach to teaching sacred texts. The other way to teach a sacred text is you find what you want to talk about and then you find a verse in the sacred text that helps you talk about what you want to talk about. You follow that? Like the Christian goes, I want to talk about forgiveness today. And then he finds some passages in the Bible where God, you know, Jesus says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And he, he builds a class around that. But really, he wanted to talk about forgiveness. And he found a place in his sacred text where it also talked about that. And then he used it as a springboard to talk about his own ideas. Does that make sense? That's today. That's what I'm doing today. I got something I want to talk about. I figured out, you know, I looked at the book and I figured out a way to link it to our sacred text. But it's not. It's just my own thoughts, my own feelings. And so that's what we're, what we're sharing today. But I figured as a starting place, I wanted to introduce you guys a little bit to what it means to be part of a textual tradition. We have a tradition. It's codified in sacred texts. 
the texts go back thousands of years. Mostly, you end up studying Sanskrit, Bengali, you want to become a pundit, learn our text, mostly you got to end up doing that. At the very least, you have to have a pretty substantial lexicon, a technical vocabulary, a technical language that you've learned that allows you access to the information contained within the text because words are used in a highly specific way and you have to be initiated into that knowledge to be able to appreciate what's being said. The same way you got to learn coding in a particular language like Java or whatever, you know, or color theory in order to be able to paint or write code. At the very least, you need a vocabulary of maybe a thousand words. At the most, you need to study a language. Maybe 500 versus, you know, 3,000, something like that. And you got to look at context and the text and the grammar and the history, but all related to the text because that text is a portal and the portal transports you somewhere else. And the way that our lineage left their legacy for future generations is they wrote stuff down. They preserved it. And the information contained therein by the faithful is as relevant and beneficial and inspirational as it was when it was first penned. You guys following this? Option two, you got nifty ideas, you want to share them with people, but you're, you're beholden to a sacred tradition, so you find some way to like, you find a verse that supports what you want to say. That's what we're doing today. You guys following? All right, here we go. I was driving up here today. I was late. I was late. My wife went to a bridal shower, baby shower, bridal shower. They're connected. <laughs> so my wife went to a bridal shower today, got home late. That meant we left late. I got up here in 31 minutes. It's pretty good. Just saying. I was charging it. And... Uh, my daughter was, was in the back, my four-year-old daughter was in the back, and she was making like some noise. She was going <laughs> something like that. Hector, you were there, right? I can't I don't even remember what exactly she was doing, but it sounded like that, right? Yeah. Hector was driving up with me. And I'm like, what is that? Like I thought she was like know, vomiting or like <laughs> spitting all over things or whatever. Just it sounded like, you know, a lot of saliva involved and like <laughs> You know, you got a four-year-old and there's a lot of saliva involved. You're like, what kind of mess are you making? In the back of my just clean car. Where are you, Alberto? My man. Thank you. Um, Alberto runs a car cleaning service, if any of you guys are interested. So, um, yeah. So, I was like, what, what is that? She was sitting directly behind me, too. So, it was like right in my ear as I was trying to focus on driving. And she stopped because she's learning how to obey me. All of my other kids learned to obey me at the age of two. But I'm, I'm slipping as I get older and I'm just less aggressive and less menacing. And so my four-year-old is less scared of me. And so she just pushes the envelope more. I'm a big fan of treating your children like dogs <laughs> when they're young. <laughs> Let me explain. The first thing you have to do with dogs, you have to teach them obedience. Sit, stand, move. Children at the age of 13 months are as intelligent as a dog. So the first instructions ch children are able to understand is the kind of commands you give to an animal. And obedience is the cornerstone of all par parenting. And the mistake that all parents make, because they're stupid, is they give their kids a ton of freedom when they're young and then try to control them when they get older. We are not designed to be controlled when we get older. We're designed to be controlled when we're young. When we can walk across the street, hurt ourselves, we can get molested, when we can eat poison, when we can do all sorts of stuff that's gonna really hurt us and we don't have the cognitive faculties to navigate life. By the time your kid's 18, legally they can do whatever they wanna do with their life. And so by the time they're 18, you wanna train them up 
that they're able to independently navigate life, which means you start off with a lot of control and then you gradually lessen the control as they get older. What most parents do is the opposite. They let kids run wild with some mistaken notion that somehow or other that's pure. And then the kids end up getting themselves in heaps of trouble. They develop terrible habits. They don't learn executive function and all the other things that are the cornerstones of a successful life, such as impulse control, as the marshmallow tests elegantly proved. You guys familiar with that series of tests? Okay, good. A bunch of tests were done at Stanford in the 60s. They led to a bunch of other tests that were done. But essentially, they gave kids a marshmallow and said, don't eat it. And if you, I will come back in 15 minutes, we'll give you another one. You have two. So then kids freaked out. They ate it because they couldn't control themselves. Those kids ended up going to jail more often, getting divorced more often, getting sick more often, dying more often, making less money, not going to college. Every single metric they could come up with, those kids performed more poorly. The kids who were able to, and they filmed the whole thing. Some kids were like licking the marshmallow, eating half it, turn it upside down, all sorts of things. Small children, like already I don't know how to deceive. The kids who were able to control their impulses ended up scoring better on every metric they could possibly come up with. Because impulse control, executive function, is the birthplace of all good things. The ability to focus. The ability to commit. So you want to cheat your kid from that because you're an idiot? Okay, that's what you get to do when you're, when you're a parent. I'm not going to make that mistake. So my kids are born when they're young. They learn to obey me. I give them instructions. Hey, do this. They don't do it. I go one, two, three. The moment my voice hits three, I jump up from wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. I run to the area where they are, not walk. I physically pick them up and put them where I want them to be. My wife's got her, I'm going to count to three, to ten, to twenty, <laughs> to a hundred. I'm going to tell your father. Like, she's like, she has this, like, she's like trying to, like, you know, she escalates the threat. I don't escalate the threat. I get the threat, and I follow through on it right away. And my kids learn. By the time I hit two, my kids jump up from the age of, like, three years old. Even my daughter, as, like, as, as pushing the envelope as she is. When I hit two, she jumps up. She cries and makes a scene, but she, she jumps up. Because she's learned. Why? Because I never don't do what I say I'm going to do with small children. Because it's the birthplace of all bad things when you don't follow through. And it's the birthplace of all good things when they learn to anchor themselves to something that's actually going to have consequences. Because they learn to govern their life around reality. That there's a law of gravity. There's a law of entropy. That cars will hurt you. That fire will burn you. That you can't just get away with anything. I'd way rather my kid got beat up at the age of five or six for being a smart aleck while I watched. Then my kid gets beat up at 18 or 20 for being a smart aleck by somebody who might actually end their life. You fall less distance when you're a small child. It's just less dangerous. I'm into scraped knees and broken bones with small kids because it saves them from prematurely ending their life when they're adults. You follow? I'm not afraid to let my kids suffer natural consequences for their actions, I see them as significant learning opportunities. And I watch just to make sure it doesn't become really problematic. But for the most part, I want to help my kids realize that there are natural consequences to mistakes in life and that they're going to have to suffer those. And that's, there's value in that because they start to learn how to navigate, not be delusional. So, I teach my kids basic German Shepherd. This is a guy named uh, Jim Fay, PhD in child education. Wrote a bunch of books called Love and Logic. I teach my kids how to obey what he calls basic German Shepherd. Come here, go there, sit down, stand up. Most people who know me watch my kids grow up. Even like when my kids are like 16, I'm like, get up, they get up. Sit down, they sit down. They laugh at me when I do it now, but they, they still do it. They understand there is a relationship between us where they obey their parents. I just don't give them instructions anymore past a certain age. I switch it up and I give them advice. So it sounds funny and you're like, that, that sounds like funny. It's actually not. It's actually as serious as anything. It's how you raise good kids. So, I told my daughter, you know, stop. She, she immediately stopped. 
I go, what is that? And her mom who's in the back with her says, oh, she was just like making fun noises. So I'm like, okay, you can go ahead and make, make fun noises, it's fine. And so she starts making those noises. Like, like a couple of minutes, she was just and It was like ridiculous, right? I was like, how does a small child do that? And it must hurt their jaw. And now it's like become like a badge of honor that she's going to do it for the entire car ride. You know what I mean? And so it was like, she was like, with vigor, she was like really going for it. <laughs> um, that interaction with my daughter in an instant reminded me of the magic of childhood where learning how to make a funny noise with your mouth or like a farting sound with your armpit or like whatever was like a discovery of a new world and something which was just interesting and, 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 and beautiful and exciting. And the world was a big adventure. And you were on an adventure and life was just fascinating and exciting and filled with like splendor and magic and, and possibility and uh, Miracles. You guys remember that? Of course you do. Even if you blocked out the bulk of your childhood due to trauma, you're still going to remember this because there was a point in your life where the world was fascinating and exciting. There was moments of that as a child. It's impossible to be born in this world and not have those experiences. However they got snuffed out, they couldn't have fully been extinguished. Just still being alive means you have some recollection. Yes or no? JC, why are you mad dogging me? <laughs> Look, looking for that nod. All right, I got it. Um, sometimes I'll be like, you guys know what I'm talking about? And everybody will be like, yeah. And somebody will be like, <laughs> like, like, what exactly are you trying to do right now? Usually they're just spaced out or, or they're going to a deep place or whatever. But sometimes I'm like, was somebody trying to start a fight with me or something? I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, my mind went there to this magic of childhood. And so here's what I wanted to say. I think that a deep commitment to integrity. Now, that's a little bit redundant. Integrity means that you live your values because you're integrated, because you're an integer, because you're whole. And therefore, what you value it's the same as what you do. You practice what you preach. You live what you say. You walk your talk. That's integrity in a nutshell. That, of course, implies that you have a set of values. You follow? You can't have integrity until you've arrived at an ethos, at a, at a worldview, at a moral theory. You have to have a system of value in place in your own mind and heart. And then when you follow that system, you have integrity. You follow? I'm going to even say, outside of theism, the principle I'm espousing is still true. It's slightly it's slightly um, uh, hypothetical for me 
because I've been deeply involved in spirituality since I was 16 years old. And so, you know, for the last 33 years, I've been deeply involved in spirituality. Therefore, all of my adult and even some of my teenage forays into value systems and integrity and having integrity have all been, all my experiments have all been conducted as a member of the Hare Krishna movement. You follow? So I don't have the experience of becoming an atheist or unreligious or, you know, like you know, either one of those. Either somebody who is generically spiritual but not religious or somebody who is not spiritual at all and is actually an atheist. I still think it's true for them and I, I base that on my own experience from before I became a devotee and the broadness of what I've experienced as a result of living my life with integrity. Based on that, I think this holds true even for an atheist. I can't be sure because my experience has been so deeply enmeshed in my own forays into religion that I have to extrapolate a little bit to think outside the box because I didn't live that atheist life. Does that make sense? Are you guys following me? I lost you, Justin? Let me say it again. I've been a Hare Krishna since I was a teenager. I think living with integrity gives you another birth and gives you a childlike innocence of existence. I think it's true even if you don't believe in God and you're an atheist. I have to, to some extent, speculate on that because I've been a theist for as long as I can remember practically speaking. Therefore, my experience of the magical effects of integrity have been within a church. But I think it would even hold true for somebody who had no particular tradition or somebody who was even an atheist. Did you follow at that time? All right. Um, When you don't do stuff behind closed doors that you wouldn't do if the doors were open, and I'm obviously not su suggesting like you go out and make babies in the street or something like that, but when you don't conduct your life in such a way where you're doing embarrassing, shameful things, things that are at odds with your personal values and the values of your community, You become pure. You feel good. And whatever you've been through in your life prior to living with integrity all becomes digestible and a learning lesson. That again is redundant. And a lesson. If you live your life with integrity today, you will begin to immediately and rapidly experience purity, feeling good, feeling whole, feeling grounded, And you'll begin to digest whatever mistakes were done to you or whatever mistakes you did throughout the entire course of your life up to that point. And you will gradually derive meaning from everything you went through such that those bad things no longer hold you down or define you in a negative way. In fact, miraculously, they actually make you a better person. I was molested. Therefore, I'm going to make sure that no one's ever molested on my watch. I'm going to be super careful to create safe spaces for all the children in my universe. I was betrayed, therefore I want to make sure I never do that to somebody else. I was deceived, therefore I'm going to connect my life with honesty because I never want to treat anybody like I was treated. You follow? 
all the terrible stuff that you may have gone through, and even the not so terrible stuff you went through, all the traumatic stuff, big and small, you went through, will, from the point you begin to live your life with integrity, forward, start to become digestible, processable, and meaningful. Doesn't mean the person who raped you did you a favor. It just means by the powerful choice you made to live your life with integrity, that terrible experience became one that you could derive meaning from and value from because you can derive value from everything. And you can always land on your feet. And you can always learn a lesson. And no one can take that ability away from you. The discovery of that communicates a freedom that's palpable, that can only really be compared to the freedom of naivete that a child experiences when they move through this world. Did you guys follow that? I'll say it again a few times. There's a freedom that you experience by living your life with integrity, a purity, a freedom from being shackled by your past, a freedom to derive meaning from everything, a freedom to learn from everything, a freedom to process and digest everything, a freedom to choose how you're going to respond to everything. That freedom that peace, that tranquility, that profoundness, that pure existence, that good life is comparable to the type of freedom and miraculousness and magic and adventure that a child experiences. The only difference is when a child experiences it, it's naivete that leads to their experience. Like my daughter, she had a doll. I think it was Aurora. And so, you know, I, I know everybody. I know Belle. I know Aurora. I know Tiana. I know Jasmine. I know Mulan. I know all of them. The whole United Colors of Benetton, children's dolls. I know all of them. My daughter's in love with all of them. So, she had a doll, I think it was Aurora. And somebody stuck her doll on a table. She's like, How did Aurora jump up on that table? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, Is it magic? I'm like, Maybe. So she's like, Or just somebody put her up on the table? I'm like, Yeah, it's possible. She's like, I think somebody must put her up on the table. So she started asking around, put her up on the table. Cat admits they put her up on the table. But then Cat says, She told him to. She's like, how did Aurora tell Cat that he was supposed to put her up on the table? And he's like, are you think Cat just imagined that? And so my daughter is grappling with, you understand? Like the laws of physics. And, and she's just be, like, she's like, like exploring that world, like having healthy doubts and thinking critically about her environment and at the same time still believing in magic and sorcery. And You understand? She'll have to get over that and like grow up because that's naivete. I get to feel like that about the deities. And that's not from naivete. That's because I live in a magical world where, where Krishna's right there. That magical adventure doesn't get cured by growing up. The more you dive into our tradition, the more that world comes to life and the more you can step into it. I think
think even for the atheist, living a life of integrity communicates powerful meaning to one's life and gives a, 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 an innocence of just being able to interact with the world without in a guileless, straightforward, honest way of integrity because there's nothing to be afraid of. You have to put on a show anymore. There's no more need for deception because you can, you can walk your talk because that's worth everything to you and you don't compromise it for anybody and you can move through life with a level of honesty and guilelessness and straightforwardness that we only find from children. I think if you do it within a spiritual tradition, it just becomes exponentially, infinitely more profound and magical and wonderful. Do you guys follow that? So, kid was making noise. I thought about my childhood, the magic of it all, that I grew up. I became a realist. But I think I discovered there was a game I played as a kid called Adventure. You were a dot. The character was a dot. Aerial view, you were a dot. You navigated through mazes and fought dragons and collected keys from different castles and you eventually won the game. It was on Atari back in the day. Like old school Atari. Like Pong Atari. Like I had that when it came out. Before in television and ColecoVision, what to speak of first generation Nintendo all of which I also had as well. I never had it in television because my neighbor had it. So we would go next door to play in television. He'd come to our house to play Atari. It was how it worked in the 70s. So, but there was a, a, a way you could do certain, like they had this like little thing where if you collected all the keys but didn't win the game, but instead went to this particular screen and you put all the keys in one place, it opened up a special portal and you could go through a door and then on like a neon lights was the name of the people who made the game. I played the game for like a year, two years of my life, like seven to nine or something like that. And, or maybe six to eight or something like that. And I remember when I discovered that, I felt like, oh man, that was like, that was like amazing. They would do this. They would put little funky stuff in video games and you'd find out about it through word of mouth. It would never be written anywhere. And you know, it would be like by word of mouth, like actually by word of mouth. And then children all over the country would pass on this information by word of mouth. And you would, it was like a, like a living tradition of spreading this information and creating this incredible world of excitement around video games. We were just coming out at that time. Like I played Pong. Like that's how like, you know what I mean? Like I was around when Pong came out. Krishna consciousness is like so much more exciting. Like so much more wondrous and magical. Just living with integrity is like that. What to speak of within a spiritual tradition. And you find something in a verse and you know years of your life go by and then you realize what's in the verse. You're like, oh my God. They knew exactly what the experience of spirituality is like. They walked this path. They were masters of it. They left these notes, these milestones. It's a map. There's a treasure. There's keys. They unlock castles. It's infinite. And the way to that is to begin living your life with integrity, which then gives you this magical key to making your entire life and every mistake you ever made and every mistake that was ever done to you all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, gradually meaningful. It happens immediately, but it takes some years for the full effects of it to wash over you and for you to process and digest everything. But on the back end, everything you've been through in life is beautiful. Everything has meaning. Not because the criminals who like hurt you were doing God's work, because you brought the magic. And everything in this world can be transformed. 
everything is mutable. Everything is transformable. And I, I found a verse, because I, you know, I want to find a verse to encapsulate it. So the verse is, Apit, apit chit, asi pape bhya, sarve bhya, papa krit tamaha. Sarvam jnana plavenaiva, riginam santarishasi. Apit chit, asi, even if you are. Papa krit tama, the greatest committer of sin. <laughs> Sounds a little Christian, but. How about just the greatest maker of mistakes? Sarvebhya, papebhya. Of all the makers of mistakes, you are the greatest maker of mistakes. That's literally what Krishna says. Sarvebhya, papebhya. Of all the committers of sin. Papa Kritama, you are the greatest committer of sin. Apicheta, <laughs> see, even if that's your situation. Of course, that's nobody's situation in this room. But even if that was somebody's situation, even in that case, sarvam jnana plavainaiva riginam santarishasi. You will cross over to the future tense. Second person. You will cross over. Sarvam riginam. All misery. Jnana Plavenaiva, jnana plava, jnana plavena, with the boat of knowledge. With the boat of wisdom, you will cross over the ocean of misery. Even if you've made more mistakes than anybody else. It fits, doesn't it? I was like, how am I going to find a verse to like make this work. And I sat down and came to me and I thought, oh, this is a good one. Even if you've made more mistakes than anybody else, you are the biggest mistake maker of all mistake makers ever. You're that soiled. You're that contaminated. You're that messed up. You're that bent. You're that twisted. On the boat of wisdom, you'll cross over all of that suffering. And the wisdom here is to live a life of integrity. And then as a devotee, it's living a life of integrity for Krishna. I actually think the integrity thing works to make your life meaningful, even in an atheistic framework. You've got other problems like nihilism and other stuff you've got to contend with. So it's not like you're out of the hot water yet. And it's, you know, it's just still problems with being an atheist. I think being an atheist is dumb. It doesn't make sense. It's an unreasonable philosophy. It doesn't correspond to the actual facts on the ground. Looking at the world should not lead you to be an atheist. If, if it does, you've got some issues you've got to work out. But I even think prior to somebody really deeply imbibing spirituality, what to speak of involving themselves in a specific tradition, I think the power of integrity is magical. Therefore, we should all live lives of integrity. What does that mean? Well, it means first you've got to develop a system of values and you've got to live according to it. And so what do we do when we hang out? We talk about systems of values for the most part. Today we talked about the value of having one. But for the most part we talk about why it's valuable to be chaste, to be faithful, to be loyal, to be honest, to be sincere, to be authentic, to be devout, etc., etc. And we try to define those terms in a serious way so they can become building blocks of a magical, childlike, but even better life. Like my daughter says, I don't ever want to grow up. Can you tell Krishna, I don't ever want to grow up. I want to be this age forever. And I'm reminded of a movie I saw like way back called Interview with a Vampire. It's like at this point, it's like a super old movie. I remember when it came out. Starring Tom Cruise, I believe. And... 
It's about a gang of vampires who live over maybe a 150 year period and, uh, and, and come of age with the you know, technological revolution and uh, kind of like work their way into the 70s and 80s and what have you um, from, the 18, from the mid 1800s. But anyway, one of the most powerful vampires is this little five-year-old girl who was like this like fierce vampire, like the four Kumars are in, in, uh, in, in the Vedic teachings. And uh, only she was a vampire, so obviously she was nothing like the four Kumars. But anyway, so just get that out there. Um, but yeah, my daughter had this idea, like, yeah, I want to be a baby forever. And I'm like, yeah, that would ultimately suck. You know? You grow up, you mature mentally, but your body never matures. Therefore, you never go through puberty, but mentally you're ready for puberty. And there's like an incredible like discord between the body you live in and the mind that you eventually develop as a result of growing up. You follow? Plus, there's like some wonderful stuff about being older and being wiser and understanding things. But there's something beautiful about that magical childhood. And I'm utterly convinced that what my daughter wants, which is to never grow up and to be a child forever, that's what Krishna consciousness is. Everything she ever wanted, everything I've ever wanted, and then some, times a gazillion. A real adventure. A real wonderland. A real fountain of youth. A real land beyond time. Okay, thank you.